My name is Nancy and I am 65 years old. My husband and I live on a pension. We have some real estate income, so we are relatively well off as long as we don't splurge. I am blessed to have a son, Travis, with my husband of the same age. Travis is a very well-behaved child, even if I do say so myself as a parent. He excelled in academics and sports from an early age and had many friends because he didn't have the personality to turn his nose up at them. He was our pride and joy, although his overly kind nature sometimes bothered me a little. That didn't change when he grew up, and after graduating from college he was able to get a job at a well-known company. His work seemed to be hard and he came home to my parents less often, but he still contacted us regularly. He had a busy but enjoyable work environment. A few years passed, when he reported to me that he had been promoted to a great position in the company, and I was relieved that things seemed to be going well. We were introduced to and, whom he said he was dating for marriage, and seemed polite, neat, and pretty when she came to greet us. Oh, I'll help you too. Thank you but you don't have to worry about me, okay? I can do this much on my own. You can take your time, okay? No, no, it's not my nature to stay still. I'll help you with anything you need, just let me know, okay? I'll carry this, won't I? I had a very good impression of Anne, who willingly helped me with my housework, saying, I'll carry this. I had only a son, and I wondered what it would be like if I had a daughter. She was that kind and thoughtful to us, and I felt that Travis had found a good woman. Soon after, Travis and End were married and we were delighted. They were blessed with children as well, having their first son, Ron, the year they married and their first daughter, Nicole, the following year. I had often heard that grandchildren are adorable, and it was so true. Travis and his family seemed to be the picture of a happy family. Time passed a few years later. When Nicole started preschool, I noticed something unusual. Travis' face seemed to be getting tired and he seemed to be getting more and more tired every time I saw him. Hey Travis, what's bothering you? Have you been feeling tired lately? What? Oh, it's nothing like that. I'm fine. Sorry to worry you. If you need anything at all, you let us know right away. We'll support you if we can. Travis smiled, trying not to worry me. Was it work-related? But if so, would he hide it since I had heard his concerns several times before? Family-related then? Come to think of it, I haven't seen much of him lately. Could that be the reason? Just as I was imagining things, wondering and worrying. My husband had passed away in a sudden accident. My mind went blank because I had not expected it. Travis took care of the funeral and all the formalities for me as I couldn't stop crying. My grandchildren were also there for me, perhaps worried that I was acting differently than usual. Their presence was a source of emotional support and cheered me up. One thing was bothering me. And had not come to the funeral. Mom, and can't come because she doesn't seem to be feeling well. Even at a time like this, I'm sorry. Travis said with a dark look on his face, as if he was having difficulty saying it. I couldn't ask him deeply during the funeral because I was too busy and sad to do so. When he calmed down, I asked him about N. Travis, it's about N. I wonder if it has something to do with you not coming to your dad's funeral and you being so depressed lately? When I gently address him, he thinks thoughtfully and falls silent. I haven't seen and for quite some time now, and things haven't been going well? 
Isn't that really why she wasn't feeling well at your dad's funeral? I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't want to worry you, I wasn't sure if I should tell you. Travis spoke slowly, occasionally asking how I was doing. I was astonished at what he said. He said that and wasn't interested in children or raising them very much. She seemed to do the bare minimum when Travis was away during the day, but she left him to pick them up from daycare and do the housework when he was home. When he asks her for a little help with housework and childcare since he's not working, she says she doesn't listen to him. In addition, she has been going out more and more on his days off and evenings. He apparently bowed down to her and asked her to come with him to his husband's funeral, of course, but she said she had business to attend to with him and left the house first. When I heard all this, I was speechless. I couldn't believe that it was only Anne. I didn't want to believe it. But I also knew that Travis was not the kind of boy who would lie about something like this. Well, thank you for telling me. What do you want to do now? Mom's worried about the kids too. Of course I'm going to raise them well on my own. As for Anne, I'm done. I'm going to wait and see how things go for a while. I don't want to make a hasty decision for the sake of the children, and most importantly, I want to believe that she will change. Travis' face was so serious that I knew better than to interrupt him and said nothing more. After that day, he started coming over to my house more often with the grandchildren. I was happy that the grandchildren took to him as well, but I still had mixed feelings because and was nowhere to be seen. Years later, Travis seemed to be patient with N, but eventually his attitude escalated rather than changed. Just as he was exhausted both physically and mentally, he discovered that and was having an affair. He couldn't afford to lose his temper and became angry with her for the affair and her attitude. He was so upset with her and she showed no signs of remorse, so he finally decided to divorce her. He was very distressed, but I thought it was the right thing to do. I don't know what was right for the grandchildren, but and didn't seem to be doing anything for them as a parent. In fact, I suspected it was neglect. I suspected it was neglect. I told myself that this was all for the best. But then Anne, who had been neglectful, came to claim custody of the child. Travis and I rolled our eyes at this unexpected turn of events. He was convinced that Anne was cheating on him, and he also accused her of neglect. However, the lawyer she had prepared was one step ahead of us in every way. The lawyer was outfoxed by the lack of evidence for both the affair and the neglect. The divorce was called a compatibility disagreement. We were shocked to find out that and would get custody of the children. We were of course not convinced, but we had no choice but to comply because we had no conclusive evidence. We were concerned about neglect. So we decided to offer some conditions in exchange for paying a larger amount of child support than the market rate. Those conditions were that we would not want to see them for the time being, and that we would allow them to talk to the child by phone twice a month. The phone call is that we will provide each of them with a kid's phone, and they will be allowed to have it. And that they do not move for the time being because we feel bad about changing the kid's elementary school and environment and was happy to accept these conditions with the added benefit of child support. I was particularly annoyed about the move, as she had originally planned to kick Travis out, and was smiling high and low about the hassle it had saved her. The end I knew was no longer there, much to my disappointment. Travis was soon evicted from the house and decided to rent an apartment nearby. I asked him if he wanted to go back to his parents' house since mine was also in the neighborhood, but he said he wanted to be as close as possible. From that day on, I spent my days pondering whether I could somehow regain custody. One typhoon night, 
a year after they divorced, with nothing I could do. It was not a day when phone calls were allowed, but I received a call from Nicole, now in the third grade. I rushed to answer the phone and she seemed to be crying. Grandma. Oh no. Mommy kicked me out. It's dark and scary. I'm hungry too. It was so sudden that I was almost distraught. If I didn't keep my cool, I would make Nicole even more anxious. Thinking this, I took a deep breath to calm myself down and spoke as usual. Nicole, calm down, okay? Don't worry, I'll be right there. Don't move from near the house, okay? Is your brother with you? No, he's not. My brother was kicked out in the evening by a man with a skull sticker who is a friend of mom's. He hasn't come back since then. He hasn't been back from there, so it's just me. The moment I heard that Ron had not returned, my eyes went blank. I had not received a phone call from Ron, so it might be at Travis' place. I told Nicole that I would hurry up and pick him up, hung up the phone, and immediately called Travis. I was then relieved to hear that Ron had arrived at the house just a few minutes ago. After that, I was able to meet up with Nicole without incident and Travis and the others decided to meet up at our house. They said they were hungry, so I decided to prepare dinner before asking them what had happened. When I saw my grandchildren happily eating their food, I was once again moved to tears, glad that nothing had happened to them. At the same time, and and the man with the skull sticker Nicole mentioned who did this to my grandchildren. Probably a tattoo sticker, but it's probably the man with whom she was having an affair. I feel impossibly angry at these two people. From the look on Travis' face, he seemed to feel the same way. Once the grandchildren had calmed down, I asked him what had happened. Then, I discovered a startling fact that I had never known before. First, it seems that the regular twice-monthly phone calls were always being watched. They told me that they had been threatened by and that if they said anything extra, she would never let them call or see them again, so they could not tell the truth. Besides, they were not served food at home on school lunch days, one meal a day on weekends, and it seemed they were not well fed. I couldn't believe my ears for this alone, but I also heard that the Skull Seal guy came to live with them right after the divorce. The Skull Seal guy seems to stay home all the time and his orders are absolute. The last time he did this, and told them to get money from her parents to buy a feast because it was her third anniversary with the man. I had no idea they were being treated this way. All I could do was gently hug my grandchildren and tell them it was going to be okay. This time, Anne's neglect was definite. She probably wanted custody for child support. However, I don't know if the testimony of the grandchildren is enough to prove the case. I was thinking that I needed something else to prove my case. Look, look, the person with the skull seal is like this. I don't like him because he is so scary when he gets angry. I don't like my mom either because she has a habit of being nice to this person but he's so strict with us. Nicole showed me the screen of her phone. It was taken in the apartment and was filled with pictures of Anne and her cheating boyfriend. Ron had also taken pictures with his phone, and he and Travis decided to check their phones together. There were a number of photos on display that showed the dates they were taken. Some of them, to my surprise, were from the period when she was married to Travis. This would be solid evidence that she was having an affair. As I looked to see if there was any more potential evidence, I found multiple videos. In one of them, I found a conversation between Anne and Nicole, which I guess they forgot to turn off the audio. Hey, Mom. I'm hungry, 
Can I have some food? Huh? You ate school lunch today exclamation question mark then you're fine. Go drink some water like you always do. Go away. I'm going out. I felt strong resentment at what I could not bear to hear. But this too would be undeniable evidence of neglect. I was glad to have the evidence. But I was afraid I was going to get out of control with my feelings of sadness and anger. After putting the grandchildren to bed early, Travis made an angry phone call. Of course, it was in on the other end, and her panicked voice leaked out of the phone and I could hear it. Hey. What's this all about? You're kicking the kids out, and that on a typhoon day. What the hell were you thinking? Hey, how do you know about that? Oh, they had their phone with theme. I just hope they're okay. Screw you. It's like you haven't even fed them enough. What about the child support? What are you spending it on exclamation question mark what do you think you're doing with my kids? I can't trust you anymore. What? What are you talking about without any proof? Well, I'll leave the kids with you for a little while because they're annoying, and you can pay me the child support." And reopened the phone, asserted her selfishness in a high-handed manner, and unilaterally hung up the phone. Travis seemed to have decided to fight for custody again. However, he could not just return the children to her. The next day, I contacted Anne's parents and asked them to intervene. Travis and I explained the situation to them, but they were skeptical. Well, it would have to happen. And was also in the process of divorcing. I'm raising my children well, and I don't have time to cheat on him. It was Travis who was doing that, wasn't it how could he blame me for what he was doing? And then she cried deliberately. So I took over the phone with Anne's parents, who wanted to hear from their grandchildren. They seemed to believe me after hearing directly from them about what had happened. The parents told and that the grandchildren could stay with whomever they wanted until the outcome of the custody battle. Later, Anne's neglect and cheating were also admitted, and Travis was able to officially take custody. She was a bit of a goner at first, but this time we had solid evidence, and when we presented it, she looked blue and admitted everything. I was able to claim child support from her and alimony from her and the cheating partner. After that, I heard that she and the cheating partner had a constant fight because of it, and they broke up. She tried to go back to her parents' house, but her parents were furious about the incident. They said, a person who can't take care of a child is not our child. And they were so disgusted with her that they cut ties with her. She had been receiving support for her living expenses, but that has of course been cut off as well. She has to pay child support and alimony as well, so I heard a rumor that she has no choice but to work part-time jobs. I heard that she wants to see her children, perhaps to distract them from her loneliness. But since a restraining order has been issued against her due to neglect, she is left to live a lonely life alone. When she does get to see them, she will not be able to fulfill that wish because her children do not want to see her. There is no room for sympathy for her, because she deserves it all. As for us, we are all going to live together in our home. I had declared when I took custody of the grandchildren that I would take care of them during the day, and above all, I wanted to be there to watch them grow up. Since my husband passed away, our quiet home has become lively and happy every day. What did you think of this story? Please subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video.